Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Annick Glode and I'm the curator of the Varley Art Gallery of Markham in Ontario, Canada. First, while we were all connecting from our various locations in the real world, I would still like to acknowledge that the Varley Art Gallery of Markham is situated on the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and in... Sorry, I'm going to restart. Okay. Ready? Action. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Annick Glode, curator of the Varley Art Gallery of Markham. While we are all connecting from our various locations in the real world, I would still like to acknowledge that the Varley Art Gallery of Markham is situated on the traditional territories of Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. We also recognize the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on this land, and in particular, the First Nations community in closest proximity to us in York Region, the Chippewas of Georgina Island. Specifically, this statement means that the gallery is committed to learning the history of this land by doing our own research, by listening, and by collaborating with artists and curators. Online is a joint initiative between Markham Public Art and the Varley Art Gallery of Markham. It delves into the potential of public art production and social engagement in the digital sphere. Driving it is the central question. Can this time of uncertainty be productive? Can it be an opportunity for us to pause and reflect, to reshape and imagine new public spatial relationships, whether built or natural, virtual or physical? Arising directly from the City Council approved Markham Public Art Master Plan 2020-2024, online explores the multiple factors that steer the making of public art, how artworks find their sites and become public. Unfolding over the summer of 2020, online has two parts, a practical webinar series on public art titled Homework, which is co-produced with public art consulting firm Art Plus Public Unlimited, and an online competition for speculative public art proposals titled Delimit. The entire initiative is hosted on and distributed by a publicly available network of digital platforms. On behalf of the Varley Art Gallery, I would like to thank the Ontario Arts Council and the Varley Mackay Art Foundation of Markham for their ongoing support. I pass um, along to my colleague, Yan Wu. Hi, thanks, Anik. And uh, my name's Yan Wu, the public art curator at the city of Markham. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to online. It is so great to see many familiar names listed under attendees. Thank you all for coming. I really wish I can see your faces. It feels quite strange that I'm actually talking to my own face. As mentioned by Anik, we have prepared a summer long online program on public art for you all to participate. Whether you consider yourself as a maker or the viewer or the producer. The reason behind choosing this platform is obviously COVID related. When Markham City Council formally approved the public art master plan as Nick mentioned earlier and a related implementation plan, I was planning a three day international public art summit for June. Actually, it was supposed to happen a week ago with public art consultant Rebecca Carbing, who is also one of the producers behind today's homework. Thank you, Rebecca, for being part of this. It has been a great, great pleasure working with you. A few weeks later, COVID-19 happened. Like everything else and everyone else, we had to postpone the submit to the fall and explore ways to move it online. Today's event is part of this ongoing exploration. Please send us your feedback after events and let us know how to improve, what works, what doesn't, what is missing. Help us to get ready for the larger summit in the fall. I believe we all have learned a lot about public space, the power of it during this special time, whether in virtual or in physical, what it means to be part of this space as a participating individual, as an agency. There is still a lot to learn and the role of public art is definitely part of this learning curve. Back to today's program, homework. 
It is a webinar series that is designed to explore the practical knowledge needed to conceptualize and produce public art projects, while focusing specifically on three themes, forms of rendering, proposal design, and the materiality and the fabrication. I do want to add one note here, that our idea of being practical in this case does not mean we try to run a vocational school that is to teach technical skills. What we are interested in is to provide a platform for knowledge exchange and production that is rooted in practice, but charged with critical awareness and imagination. A variety of professionals working in the discipline will contribute their voices throughout the week. Hope you can still be with us on Wednesday and Friday. The registration links can be found in the chat box as well as the overview of our online project. Today's topic is uh, forms of renderings. The history of rendering tells a story of an entanglement between technology, critical reflection, and the shaping of life. In this webinar, David Rugby will guide us through the conceptual dimensions of rendering and what it can be, especially in the digital sphere. Martin Kanzadir, Martin Kansadir's presentation will show how historical influences endure in the present and how they enable alternate ways of thinking. Just a quick note, and um, if you have any questions during the presentations, please submit to the Q&A box and we, there will be a, des a dedicated Q&A period at the end of uh, today's session and appreciate your patience. Now, with great pleasure, I'm going to introduce today's moderator, Vivian Lee. VH Vivian Lee is principal and the founder of Toronto-based architecture studio Lamas. Her work focuses on the role of craft in architecture as related to labor, professional practice, vernacular traditions, and ornament. She has extensive experience in the design and the construction of public space, including the East River waterfront in Lower Manhattan. In addition to her role at LAMAS, Vivian is also assistant professor of architecture at the University of Toronto and a previous, previously at the University of Michigan. Prior to founding LAMAS, Vivian practiced as a project manager at Shop Architects and LTL Architects in New York City. Vivian received her Master of Architecture from Harvard's Graduate School of Design. She holds a BA, studio, uh, she holds a BA in studio art from Wesleyan University. Okay, switch camera and now comes Vivian. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for the introduction and um, thank you for inviting me to uh, the homework webinar series, my first webinar series ever. So bear with me here if um, there are any technical difficulties here. Um, so as Yan mentioned, my background is an architect. And so when I was asked to kind of introduce uh, the topic of rendering, I wanted to research a little bit more about the history of the word. So the, in the visual art sense of this word rendering, it only became a noun, le rendu, in post-revolutionary France in the 19th century. This transformation of the word from a verb to a noun, rendering, uh, demonstrates the desire to quantify the mechanical productivity at the time. The geometrical art of calculating cast shadows to two-dimensional line work is elevated to a whole new experiential level of, de of depicting space, a technique academicized and established by the French Ecole des Beaux-Arts. So, when designing at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, uh, to render means something that happened to paper, where line work gets shaded with sepia or china ink and watercolor. Le rendu also means to make complete, uh, according to the principal pedagogue at uh, l'Ecole des Beaux-Arts, Quatremere de Quincy, um, not a single line was left without volumetric or atmospheric enhancement, not a facade without a shadow, not a niche left empty of sculpture, not a sculpture left unshaded, and every triptych raised off the cornice and off the page and every marble vein drawn in. So 
renderings uh, in this kind of architectural sense and established as part of the curriculum was a way by which architects started to think about buildings to be infused with character. Sometimes renderings were um, asked to depict a building or a space as male or female, spring, summer, fall, or winter. Um, another uh, interesting note about this word is that the Beaux-Arts use of the word had a very curious triple meaning. It simultaneously meant, means to color a project, but also the finished project, but also the delivery of the project. Now I bring this all up because I think the history and the ambiguous use of this word will be a part of the presentations and the discussions today. As since then, we've ventured into the world of certainly digital renderings and others that will be mentioned uh, by our speakers today. Both architects and artists have long explored this conflated terms at all stages of the design project. So le rendu, the rendering, is all at once a tool for depiction and ideas generation and spatial manipulation. So I am going to introduce our first speaker of today, and uh, that is David Rokeby. David is an installation artist based in Toronto. Since 1982, his work has been performed and exhibited across Canada, the United States, Europe, and Asia. For the first part of his career, David focused on interactive pieces that directly engaged the human body or that involved artificial perception systems. His early work, Very Nervous System, is widely acknowledged as a pioneering work of interactive art, transplanting physical gestures into real-time interactive sound environments. In the last decade, his practice has expanded to include video, kinetic, and static sculpture. In 2007, David completed major art commissions for the Ontario Science Centre and the Daniel Langlois Foundation in Montreal. His 400 foot long, 72 foot high sculpture entitled Long Wave has been one of the most celebrated projects in the Toronto Luminato Festival. Recent projects include a series of video works which explore the patterns traced by movements across time, an installation evoking the presence of Marshall McLuhan in the coach house where he worked for the 2010 Contact Festival, and a new interactive sound installation entitled Dark Matter, commissioned by Wood Street Galleries in Pittsburgh. He is currently preparing a new work for the Ryerson Gallery and Research Center in Toronto. David has been a recipient, a recipient of a long list of awards, so I'll just include a few here. Um, the first BAFTA Award for Interactive Art in 2000, a 2002 Governor's General Award in Visual Arts and Visual and Media Arts, a series of Pre-Arts Electronica Golden Mika Award for Interactive Art, and the World Technology Award for the Arts in San Francisco in 2004. So without further ado, I'd like uh, to introduce to you David Rokeby. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to launch mostly right into my presentation for which I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so hopefully this will work properly. Let me just try here. And go. Okay, I have to go way back though, of course. I don't. There we go. So um, I was very happy that uh, Vivian started off with a, uh, an interpretation of the word um, rendering and the, the rendering and the idea to render. And I'm going to take it even further back. Um, if you look at the uh, etymology of the, of the word to render, it's a late 14th century thing uh, in Old French, meaning to repeat or say again, uh, coming from the term uh, rendre, oh sorry, from the term rendre, give back, present, or yield. That's from the vulgar Latin rendere, uh, going back to the Latin, Latin rendere, give back, return, and restore. And I was really interested in the fact that there's this notion of giving back, of giving, of giving back. And this brings it really um, into the center of, the, of things that I've been trying to do with my work for a very long time. 
Now, if we look at another, uh, another defi a definition of render, we have to cause someone or something to be in a particular state or to change words into a different language of form. And so I sort of combined all these together in a lot of the work that I do, causing someone to be in a particular state by giving something back through a process of translation or transformation. There's no way in these 20 minutes I'm gonna be able to do justice to those ideas in the context of my work. So I'm gonna take a very particular jog through a few different ways that I've used rendering and ideas of rendering, rendering in my work. And I'm not gonna, there's not enough time to give a lot of context around them. So um, I love questions, so please hold on to questions. Uh, your questions will make sense out of my presentation. And I realize I did not start my, my clock here. Okay, start. Um, so the first piece I'm going to talk to about very briefly is a piece called Very Nervous System. It's very important um, for me because it, it renders in a very particular way. It translates body movement into sound. And what that does is it, it gives people um, a different reading on, it gives back, shall we say, to use that term from render, it gives back people another representation of their movements in a way that they might not have expected. And that creates a feedback loop. So for me, rendering is part of a feedback loop, really. And in, in a sense, um, I suppose it also is in terms of iterative design. There's a feedback loop. You, you, you try something, it's, it's given back to you. And that what's given back to you causes you to change what you're doing. In the case of very nervous system, you, you make a gesture. The response to that gesture comes back to you before you're evenly fully conscious of the gesture you've made. So it's a very real time experience and you're continually flowing in response to the way your movements are being rendered in sound. So there's a kind of um, a continuous feedback loop where the location of control is actually um, kind of lost. You don't know if you're, con you're controlling it or it's controlling you. So this notion of real time rendering of rendering that you can respond to in an, in an immediate way is, is very important to me. Um, in fact, at this point in working with my nervous system, I realized that because I program these things and programming at the time was done mostly in machine code in the early part of this project in the, 80, in the early 80s, the time to produce the code or to change it was so long that it was almost impossible to, to fluidly respond to the kind of things that happened. So I uh, went through a process of creating tools for myself to allow me to change the way the system rendered the movement into sound in real time. And that led to a whole explosion of possibilities, um, which, I, with, which had a great impact on my career, which I also don't really have time to go into. So, um, the point there though was real-time experiences demand real-time design tools. Uh, and a lot of my working process is actually designing tools to allow me to, um, to work with, imagine, and construct the kinds of ways I'm going to provide experiences, to render experiences for the viewer as, uh, uh, from my perspective as an artist. The second piece I'm gonna to talk to uh, talk about is a piece called Taken from 2002. And in this work, there's a surveillance camera in one corner of the space, um, taking live footage of activities within the gallery. And it, uh, it separates those in a number of ways. It re-renders them in a sense. Uh, one is to separate all the background, show just the people and show them looping over time. So there's an accumulation of all the activities in the gallery over the course of that day. Another is to zoom in on heads and track them very precisely. I'll show you a little video. Hopefully it won't be too choppy for you. I've gone super low resolution here. So we'll see if this, how well this works. Um, you can see here it's zoomed in on my head and it's, it's very precise so that it actually, in a sense, removes your ability to place, to place yourself in space in this bl the blue side here. So it's a very strange experience of being, it's almost, almost like an adversarial kind of rendering. You're being extracted from from your, your physicality in that space. The other side is showing the accumulation of, of, of several hours of activity in this, uh, in this gallery space. Um, from here, the first time I was invited to do a public artwork was a project called Cloud for uh, the, the Ontario Science Center. And it posed an interesting problem to me because none of the normal sort of video or enclosed space things um, that I usually do were gonna be possible because it was a brightly lit space, the uh, Great Hall at the Science Center. 
So I ended up having to make my own renderer that would allow me, so I coded my own renderer in a context that would allow me to really see the dynamics of the piece I was imagining. And this is a piece that would not have been really possible to do without those sorts of tools. So this is, uh, this is a rendering, uh, this is one of the early renderings that, that I presented uh, for this project. Um, I think this is a little larger than the, the, the end result. There are 100 shafts that are hanging, rotating at very precisely controlled rates of speed. This is a photograph of the end result installed uh, there. Oh, it's moving through quite quickly. This is, a, this is a sort of a side commentary. It seems to be jumping through these faster than I expected. Hold on. Whoa. Oh, right, sorry. It's simply that I made that into a movie, so I'm stuck with my own time. So you'll have to bear with me here. I can move ahead a little bit, I think. Okay, here we go. So uh, this image is showing um, the infrastructure it took to take what was originally a very abstract uh, theoretical notion, this, this image, this, this rendering, and to actually render it into physical space was a fairly enormous task. Um, there's kind of an irony between the almost virtuality of the experience of the work and the physicality required to make it happen. Here is now a rendering of the sort of primary experience of this work. As these come into synchronization, you get a big um, sort of transition from almost transparent to very solid. Um, I won't go into the reasons behind this, but and here is a video of the actual work. And here's one of the things that was very interesting to me was that uh, there were things that I could predict from the rendering and there were things that were completely unexpected, like the character and quality of the reflections on the clear surfaces. And um, that, was, uh, that was an interesting discovery that a lot of the exciting things that will happen in the work, even when you're carefully rendering them, will not happen in the rendering itself. I'm going to skip ahead here. The next piece I'm going to show you uh, was also would have been impossible without rendering. Uh, just to refer back to cloud for a second, one of the things that was important to me about cloud, and it's hard to represent without physically taking you there, is that at any given state, it's it's it looked uh, remarkably different because from certain angles it would seem to be in synchronization, and other angles it would seem to be in chaos. And there was something about this notion of the subjective view. Um, from each different position in the space. And it was important for me to have a very fast render that could show me the dynamics of it and allow me to position myself very quickly in many different spaces to understand what the ultimate experience would be like. But also to, th to, to play around with the idea <clears throat> that um, even though this piece was not interactive, that by the fact that it was open to so many different perspectives from so many uh, points of view, um, uh, that, that made it interactive in a very specific way, in the way that a classic sculpture is, I suppose, but take, looking at that very directly. The next piece is similar in that sense, uh, Long Wave. It was a piece uh, done for the uh, Luminato um, Festival in Toronto. The original proposal looked something like this. It's a very, very long space, um, 400 feet long, 80 feet tall, and uh, not terribly wide. And I started to play with uh, what would provide a very large experience that guided the eye in a way, i.e. it sort of guides the camera of the person who's looking um, to follow this, this giant loop, but also provides very different experiences from very different perspectives. So I spent an, an enormous amount of time within this rendering. And again, this rendering is done with my own uh, rendering code because um, I needed to be able to be, for it to be very fluid and I didn't have other tools uh, at the time that would be capable of this. Um, so it allowed me to really um, explore this intuitively as a, as, a, as a set of possible viewpoints uh, in a way that was really important for the production of this work. It really wouldn't have been possible without, without pre-rendering. And this is a little bit of the, uh, the final thing. There's always something very, it's a very curious experience for me when I finally see a work that I've lived with the rendering of for a very long time when I finally see it in space. And there's a weird, uh, a very strange sense of the, the real and the virtual coexisting in space. And in a sense, this, this work, which is, which is really a rendering of a, of, a, of a radio wave, somewhere between an FM and an AM uh, frequency radio wave through the space. That was one of the intentions of the actual works of this other, this is other layer rendering. Um, it has a kind of mathematical clarity, but 
it turns out it's made of really physical objects, which eventually had to be taken down and deflated into a pile, into a puddle on the floor. So the next uh, thing I'm going to talk about with rendering is how, uh, rendering is how I do site-specific work for sites that do not exist yet. I really love responding to sites when doing artwork. I don't know really how to do public art, I think, without a site to work from. And that poses a particular problem when you do not have that site available to, to you, especially if what you're trying to present is not, not, not mostly conceptual, but it, it's largely an experiential uh, thing. So, so how it feels to be in the space of the work is extremely important. So you need to somehow grasp or understand that. So the next piece I'm going to show you, this is a piece that uh, public artwork that was never made, um, but it was one that plays with rendering in a totally different way. Um, so this was for um, Bad Late East, uh, Brookfield Development's uh, presentation. And I, I proposed a very large video wall on one of these wall surfaces. And I had a variety, too many in fact, I think, uh, ideas for what to do with this wall, including putting historical walls in its place to work against the existing stuff, to sometimes to cast uh, shadows and, and light things across these historical spaces. Uh, but then also, um, to use live video footage outside the space to create a kind of moving freeze inscribed into a video representation of the same materials used in the other parts of the architecture. Um, to a complete destruction of the space using a physics model. I do a few of these because they were tremendously fun. Uh, here's a rubber sheet model for the same thing. I hope these are coming out fairly decently in the in uh, across zoom here and this one is um falling apart to show an architectural rendering of what the space would be if it there didn't if there hadn't been an obstruction to that space here and finally a uh, rendering of a sheet blowing away to reveal the emptiness of the media surface the video wall that was that was there so that was using um rendering in a different sense. So obviously I've rendered the scene, but I've also rendered the scene within the scene. The rendering that would, the renderings that I was pr proposing to present there were, cha were challenging, confounding our experience, our visual render of the space. Because of course, the strange thing about a vision is that it's not uh, a scientific representation. What we see of something is not a scientific, a pure instrumental representation of what we see. It's fabricated. We render what we see in our visual cortex. There's a lot of uh, fiction and uh, memory that's involved in how we actually see. Um, so this notion of, of challenging through using the embedding renderings in the architectural space to challenge our experience of the space itself is a way to sort of challenge that the fiction that we propose to ourselves uh, as we walk around the world. The next work deals with rendering in a very, very different, different way and gets back to this notion of giving back that I pulled from in, in terms of rendering to begin with. Um, rendering was an important part of the process. And again, I, it was very important because of motion in this case uh, that I work with very, very low quality renderings that gave me a full sense of motion. Um, this is a long uh, video wall that, is, does, that presents fragments of Calgary history. This is a very strange underpass area in Calgary that is below grade. So you're below grade for about 30 seconds. And I thought of it as a portal where you go into the past and you experience um, these uh, fragments of everyday life of, uh, from the early uh, first 25 years of the history of Calgary, um, advertising slogans, little snippets of pedestrian day-to-day -day life stuff. Because I wanted to propose to the people passing by the, the process of imagining, of in a sense, again, rendering for themselves an idea of what the city was like, where they were walking, the space they were walking, what that, what that city, this place was like in, in previous times. So this, and just as here's a kind of a interesting play between the rendering and the final thing. Here's a little bit of the actual thing. Um, At first, people, I think, thought it was just another advertising sign. So it took about, it took a couple of months before people started to notice, wait a minute, what is, what is, what exactly is going on here? But it's really sort of a, 
become a space where people can think about their city in a different way. In fact, you can text to the sign and texting to the sign um, generates, generates uh, responses that are related to the subject matter that you're texting. Um, first, this is a, I also injected some, um, some quotations from the, uh, from memories of elders from the time in Calgary before, uh, before the settlement of Calgary. But then you'll see here as well uh, that you can text to the artwork to jog its memory. So texting disease resulted in what we're about to see. I like to think of, I, I spent a lot of time uh, years ago thinking about rendering and comparing the act of rendering in virtual reality, for example, to the act of reading a novel. Um, when you're in virtual reality, there is a text, which is the program, it's generating this rendering that you're experiencing, it's filling in all the details and gaps. When you're reading a novel, you're reading a text as well. That text is pulling things from your repertoire of materials and memories and piecing together something in order to represent and to render that, that story, those words into something that's close to an experience. So in this piece in Calgary Scroll, in a similar way, words are used as a way to conjure up an image of a, a, of a time in the past. Final thing I'm gonna show you is uh, another proposal for the other tower of Bay Adelaide North. Uh, this one where I took the counter I went opposite to the direction that many, many architects are going now. I wanted to render as real, realistically as possible because I wanted to do a very, very simple gesture that would take advantage of the materiality and the structure of the space, work against it in certain ways to give the maximum experience with the minimum effort and rendering reflections and, and, and things like that was absolutely essential. So this is the other extreme of rendering compared to the ones I've been showing you where I'm working very hard to be true to the atmospheric light, to the uh, reflection off the surfaces that are designated for this building that at that time did not exist, or still doesn't quite exist, um, and, the, and the behaviors of the windows. And you can see here between the night and the day shot, the reflection characteristics are extremely important to the experience of the work. Um, and it was absolutely essential for me to, to be to be uh, very honest in the rendering so that I didn't um, overpromise or, or have unexpected effects uh, as a result. Because you can see already between these two, uh, there's a lot going on there and I needed very accurate reflection representations to understand the, the implications of that. And uh, that's that, thank you very much. Hi again, everyone. Thank you, David. That was very exciting. I can't wait to discuss it. Um, I'm gonna first introduce our second speaker and then we'll have time for a little Q and A um, and discussion. Um, so our uh, second and last speaker, Marcin Kadir is the director of the Center for Cultural Landscapes at Willow Bank and founding editor of journal Scapegoat, Architecture, Landscape, Political Economy. He has taught art and architecture at the University of Waterloo, University of Guelph, OCAD-U, and the University of Toronto, where he is a senior fellow at Massey College. Marcin is also a dancer, avid reader, chess player, and thinker about media, technology, space, and representation. He is currently working on a deconstruction project, understanding materials from a political, digital, and mythological transcendental point of view. For today's talk, Marcin will discuss the history of rendering, how it reveals an entanglement with technology, critical reflection, and the shaping of life. So Marcin, please um, sign in, I guess. <laughs> Hi. Hello. 
nice to see everybody. Hi. Um, render yourself visible, uh, please. Uh, no, just kidding. I'm, I'm going to stop awkwardly yelling on my screen and I'm going to share, <laughs> share my actual screen. I'm talking about rendering, the possibilities of rendering, uh, as Yan outlined as well, for a construction of different kinds of worlds and as well as for representing or rendering visible things that are currently hidden, maybe in your own, in your own uh, uh, situation. When we think about the current crazy, um, really unbelievable situation of en entangled racial, economic, health, judiciary, media, even uh, possibly voting, uh, cyber and environmental crises, um, we have to try to look to rendering as a way of looking at and imagining different kinds of realities, different kinds of worlds that might be possible. Uh, this is a mass rendering after the, uh, after the um, collapse of the World Trade Center. Um, a mass uh, prophetically anticipates the increase in military funding, um, which is uh, $2 billion a year. Uh, and we see the repercussions of that since a lot of that funding is also for police forces for military grade equipment. Uh, this one reconstructs or re-renders the towers in camouflage, uh, playing off the homogeneity and, and the anonymity of the grid as well as of the glass towers. Um, I mean, deceptively though, the camouflage is, does not fit into the city, uh, but, but it, it has an opacity which underscores the surveillance from the inside of the towers that possibly is, is, uh, is visible to the outside, but the towers themselves remain opaque. Uh, when we look at something like Scott Sorley's work, he's rendering visible protesting and this technique of kettling, which is an enclosure of protesters via, uh, via walls that are uh, formed by um, riot police. This is a way of understanding the techniques of power that are used in the space that are in addition to, but layered on top of the architectural space. And this is an interesting thing to bring in so that we think about rendering as a process and as uh, dealing with intangible elements and social relationships and uh, systems of power, not just physical spaces. We have, um, uh, to stay on this topic, uh, this is uh, from three, uh, three, four years ago, uh, Jean Gang's uh, submission to the Chicago Biennial, where she did a history of policing. I just want to quickly look at this so you can see the kind of uh, inconspicuous beginnings of the watch box and the person that would report the weather, as well as if a hurricane is coming, as well as police. Uh, but this is just one example of how to think about history as, as presenting alternatives to different ways of thinking about the current situation that we have, whether it's the uh, policing or the construction of of your world and how you live. Uh, the way that uh, lighting in increased uh, safety uh, as ostensibly as well as elongated your social day, created the idea of nightlife. Uh, and here the light, light plus phone was the dual uh, means of um, creating safety in the space. Uh, the car changes everything. The police car is a mobile incarceration unit and patrolling uh, surveillance unit. And the police station changes to become um, this larger hub uh, that coordinates the traffic of the, of the police car and has a different relationship to the street and the neighborhood um, in, these, in these examples. So uh, she's, using, she's using rendering to imagine what kind of relationship you have that dismantles the power of the, of the current situation by imagining different spaces, different kinds of relationships with uh, police that are from the community. So th this isn't as radical as, as defunding the police, but it is a uh, understanding that, that the policing would happen from within the inhabitants of the community. If we uh, back up a little bit, uh, this was mentioned by a couple of people in an interesting way. I want to talk about this thing that was bugging uh, Renaissance thinkers was the conflict between Desenio and Colore or the kind of, uh, you, thought the, you thought the biggest Renaissance uh, controversy was uh, if Michelangelo or Raphael were better, but um, it's actually uh, more like, it's more like the Venetians and Colore, um, which is, uh, as mentioned by, by David and Vivian and others, uh, it's the atmospheric, the, the uh, shading, the color, the texture, uh, actually the clouds. Clouds play a pivotal role as the, as the trees and landscape, which is very difficult to capture in a one point perspective, which rationalizes the space, turns into a grid, functions in tandem with developments of property uh, regimes and colonial practices that 
map territory and take ownership of land uh, abroad. So it, it's all uh, absolutely contemporary uh, after the Renaissance and this uh, beginning of the modern period. When we see the Temple of Solomon, that's also where the laws are written, Genesis written on the walls. Uh, an unusual thing about this uh, rendering though is that there's three different time periods uh, when we see the same characters repeated in the background at different moments in time. So the field of the grid is an atemporal grid in a, in a way a transcendental space in which different activities occur. Um, here the figures are as significant as the architecture but actually background where the main protagonist is the tree, is the landscape, the landscape itself and different techniques, uh, repoussoir meaning the trees are pushed to the foreground and the layering using contrast to indicate space rather than the grid. So we see colore establishing itself in a very different way and disegno, obviously the root of design is about drawing, um, is about um, delineating lines. Uh, and as we know, geometry is not innocent. It regiments space as, as a, in Versailles. Uh, here we have uh, an emphasis on the, the pigment, the pigment, the materiality. Uh, you know, before this is a representation of the landscape, it enacts the landscape because the pigments are actually uh, burnt sienna, for example, or other insects that are crushed or uh, ivory black, you know, black scraped off the bones after they've been burnt to create the pigment. So they already have a materiality, they already have a relationship to the landscape, enacting it before they even represent it. So it's, uh, it's a different way of thinking, but I, I love how that is represented in our current uh, split, or at least a uh, slight division between what Illustrator does and what Photoshop does. Uh, uh, rendering the way the way uh, David described it, and, and how we do it is is vector graphic based. When we make the model, make the digital model in a um, in a in a space. Oh, it's there. It's there. It's, it should be the other way around. Is it DWG? Rend uh, rendering happens uh, in vector graphics, and uh, I mean to build the model, but then to render it to create the materiality and the and the textures and the light uh, is a pixelation format. Just just quickly, this the vector graphics are little mathematical equations. They're scaleless. You can scale up a DWG or a PDF or an AI to to a billboard size. It keeps the resolution because lines are understood as a math mathematical equations between points as coordinates. Here the image is turned into pixels and it's a whole different world. So, so that resolution uh, decreases and, uh, you know, on the other hand, the subtlety of the different gradations of light can be captured in these formats. So just a bit of a interesting um, continuation of this history into the contemporary uh, world through uh, pixel or raster versus vector graphics. Um, speaking of clouds, uh, just because clouds are uh, protagonists here and David has a cloud project, so that was cool. Um, clouds. Uh, I like this one, uh, this rendering of the cloud as the atmospheric embodiment of the rendering, but then we see the infrastructure that actually holds up, which is more of this disegno, if you like, the rendering of these lines, or uh, I'm gonna use uh, drawing out rather than rendering there. But then we see them used in brilliant ways by someone like Wiseman, where in a forensic architecture uh, methodology, the various kinds of attacks and bombings uh, in in Palestine and the West Bank are used as uh, um, kind of kind of ways of understanding the situation by modeling the complicated flow, the kind of ever changing flow of the uh, and transformation of the dust clouds from the bombs to locate the positions in space. So sophisticated architectural uh, software to try to uh, capture and, and analyze this form. Uh, we're taking it back to the old school, um, Mies. Uh, ha sorry, I have to talk about this. Uh, I think Matthew Allen's on the line. Uh, I'm going to use his analysis of the Bauhaus as an as a interesting moment where the disconnection from the vernacular um, that is perceived in, in the kind of uh, things like the World's Fair and the uh, interest in mass production, uh, also, uh, you know, the primitive accumulation for, for all that is, is, the, is the colonialism that supplies all the cotton as well as the wealth to uh, industrialize. It's uh, important to uh, mention. The, um, the, the perceived separation from vernacular artifacts is, uh, is compensated by, by the Bauhaus a little bit by trying to reconcile mass production with craft. Now, it's interesting to see in these images, the collages, 
that the space becomes background, space becomes just a neutral grid, and the materiality and, and really life is, is uh, promoted and um, created by artifacts, objects that, that have a liveliness of their own. And it highlights the, an architect's um, imagination and iterative process where iterations are, are in a way like genetic transformations. And uh, there's a lot of uh, biological language in, the, in that lexicon where many different versions create a kind of uh, growth and development over time or in the life of the uh, object. Um, I like this project, um, the, uh, these images about how Mies draws with his relationship of the body to the work um, appropriate for the form of representation. So drawing the plan on the flat table, the, this is a kind of an elevational perspective view uh, facing upright, he's standing upright because his relationship to the drawing is maintained as he's drawing it. So we see a bit of this, uh, if, you, if you want to be Renaissance about it, it's a sacra conversazione between, or sacred conversation between different elements and materials that exist in this abstract space that are brought together. Uh, this abstract space uh, can lend itself to a kind of multiplicity and we've seen how different representations of space that are there to enable hybridity as in this OMA project. Uh, the thing there being that uh, first, first you have to have an idea about program as disjointed and uh, segmented or in this drawing where zoning itself is taken on as a category and then we have unbelievable zones like that, that from far away look like goosebumps different kind of zones that change your idea about what a, what a zone actually is. I'm not going to dwell on that too long. I'm going to move on to this. Uh, also sticking with Matthew Allen, uh, please read his uh, piece on the screenshot aesthetic. Uh, this, is, this is what I was interesting to hear. Vivian mentioned the uh, completeness about rendering and, and even the way uh, David is unsettling this idea of the rendering as a finished work. Uh, what we see here is that the move to um, rendering as a, as a verb and not a noun or a, as, a, as a thing as a process actually, uh, which was previous uh, understanding of it. That understanding is brought back, but in conjunction with this idea that uh, homework or yeah, constant work, this, this idea that um, your work is the project in itself, and the, the process of working is the project. And here we see uh, the digital world is maintained and even augmented by a hand drawing to show the more scattered uh, oops, elevational uh, ideas there. So we see, uh, we see the, the red line uh, tracing the kind of the movement of cyclists and people, air infiltrating in, inside, uh, I guess someone's going hunting. So some life is negated in this, in this as well, while uh, creating a, a digital atmosphere that is, is uh, brought in, in conversation with the rendering. Um, and um, Matthew Allen points out the uh, elevational uh, dimensional information is, is um, kind of incomprehensibly brought together with the material and atmospheric aspects as well. Uh, so we see this develop in different ways. Uh, this is uh, Will Fu, uh, just finished at Princeton. And we see here using the table as a kind of a uh, cubist tableau on which different artifacts talk to each other. Uh, and some of these uh, more primitive graphics, uh, TVs built into the space, uh, and interestingly, the things that the aspect, the object with the most reality are the technological apparatuses themselves, uh, whereas uh, other things maintain a, a deliberate uh, illusory quality or kind of a, a really a quality, uh, really a quality that's tied to the language or the medium of technology, actually. So it's not that they're illusory, they're using the properties of the medium of the technological itself to inform the rendering, to treat it as a material. Uh, and the kind of sickly green is, uh, I mean, that reminds me of uh, 2 a.m. at 7-Eleven when you're in architecture school. It's like this, yeah, you're, you've drank too much coffee and you're seeing that kind of green. Uh, and we see rendering as a, in a way, a genre, different genres of, of uh, imagining space. Through, this is vaporwave, a musical, but also fashion and a graphic genre. And we see how the nostalgic technology is intermingled with uh, bizarre cultural references, and uh, but really positioning the Pacific as the center of the world um, on which all these things flow in. So, uh, really, I uh, suppose in vogue uh, rendering um, mode is the post-digital, where it assumes the prevalence of, um, of the digitality, the digital world is now so, so pervasive, it's, it's uh, infiltrating all aspects of your, of your life. So it, instead of hiding that, these ones 
celebrate it. Um, they, they have this uh, influence um, of David Hockney of uh, the flat planes of abstract color. Uh, Rousseau, uh, the primitive, so uh, historical references that are intermingled in here to, to really upset also the future uh, centered um, aspect of rendering, the kind of projection of a future reality. Well, here we're saying history is now and history is an entanglement of all these different positions and subjectivities from the past. Uh, but we also see this Mies van der Rohe uh, idea of, of the architecture being background or a framing device for the natural world. Uh, so these things are imminent to the to the rendering, and I should point out when we're thinking about a, uh, the, this project that's eventually a public art competition. Uh, what is Google? What is Google Street View? And how different modes of movement inform Google? So there is a gondola. There is different crafts on the water, but we also have a camel retracing silk routes and other passages. The form of movement is so essential and it changes space. So it needs to be a bodily understanding um, as, you, as you can, uh, as we'll see in a sec, throw out some other examples. Uh, the city is different if you're walking around with a stroller or if you're rollerblading, uh, which you're, you're probably not, but if you're running or, uh, or, or uh, driving, it's a very different city, different things emerge that are reference points. Uh, this is uh, back to the, uh, Renaissance grid, this is uh, thousands of balloons that uh, Google plans to deploy all over the world to create uh, better access for, for internet worldwide. Would you bring me to this other maybe mythological or media aspect of rendering? So the, uh, this is uh, something I'm not exactly celebrating, but this use of memes um, in current uh, discussions where in a way you're living, you're experiencing through the people you're posting. So. I want to be a little more serious about this than, than, uh, than simply thinking about um, looking at people. You're inhabiting the bodies and the subjectivities of who is in this space. And, how, and to what extent is our media images complicit in that? Um, here we see how the inflatable architecture and the scaffolding create a sense of uh, movement, temporary, uh, temporariness, and, or kind of the ephemeral, uh, dismantling this kind of fixed or permanent idea about architecture or the rendering. And in the in a way, we see things sketched in that, that uh, show this fabric. So this this uh, this this uh, breaks down a bit this idea of lifestyle as as a commodity and building or space or you yourself as a commodity that is exchanged in this space. But it tries to imagine more uh, more this process of how really desire itself is constructed. Um, th that's an interesting thing I want to talk about in rendering in in uh, in, uh, in general is. Once space is colonized fully, then it goes deeper and starts to create new desires, create new desires in you. Even your aesthetic categories are suspect because the disturbing uh, possibility is that they're engineered or that maybe the aesthetics are designed or you, you've learned them in some sense, uh, meaning that it's a very difficult thing where your bodily, you're, you're responding to something's affects and something, the rendering is all about this kind of effect on you but that is suspect because your deepest interiority might be designed. Okay, insert pause there and you can go think about that for a second. It has repercussions for who the hell is in public space and how we render things like monuments um, because they're ostensibly uh, role models or figures that whose, uh, whose persona we want to inhabit or emulate or at least respect in some sense, but they're over coding the city. So these uh, the statues as a kind of, um, a, a long linear pillars, if you will, of uh, historical public art that are from the point of view of the state and lock history, lock a certain reading of history for all time. Now we see the movement of them, the dismantling of them, or kind of crude erasure, horse, uh, Danvo, fragments of the Statue of Liberty, uh, the counter monument proposal to say, to suggest that the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin uh, to leave it in ruins when it was in ruins, not to rebuild it, but let the ruins be a perpetual counter monument that allows you to imagine new monuments that are that are more central, more relevant. Um, Tatsunishi, this idea of this, his uh, project called Discovering Columbus. Columbus is still there in Columbus Circle. He creates an interior around it. Here's the rendering. He brings you right into your living room. 
Christo and Jean Claude, turning the object, uh, turning the, or anyway, turning into an object from a subject, a physical thing, but also, um, I guess, negating the uh, the uh, the content. Myelin uh, now is a iPhone case as well. Uh, it was supposed to be background. It's supposed to, it's this, you know, the, the cut or the the camera monument that is uh, that is hard to be a physical object because physical objects mediate your relationship to the past. And what what the argument here is that emptiness, voids, background, nothingness, scars, uh, taking away is a better monument. The the absence is a better monument because it acknowledges and deals with the loss that you're commemorating rather than a physical thing that replaces your relationship to the past. So it's the, it's the way that landscape can be treated that way. So being an iPhone case, it is a background for your phone. Um, I believe I only have a couple more minutes. Okay, uh, let me, let me um, address this last point, which is for who and the scale of rendering. So the, because we have a, a kind of idea about a human reality, about uh, us humans, um, Kelmo investigates how the molecular and rendering the molecular of materials is, is, is of utmost importance because your body reacts differently to it. Uh, Jane Hutton underscores this idea about global material flows and how a place like Central Park is connected to islands in, this, in uh, South America, as well as to all the labor that uh, went into building it. So the site is simultaneously the building you're presenting, as well as the labor, as well as the materials and where they came from. Uh, we see uh, new developments by uh, J Jessica Zhao um, using material alchemists, actually creating new materials that don't exist in this, uh, in this software. Um, we see this uh, idea about who is in the rendering and how the body itself, the rendering creates a body. And the question is, what kind of body? And what are, or do we include animals and other stories? Because if not, uh, we get this, the uh, city of Vaughan, uh, as far as I know, it's not, not a joke, but a serious rendering with a robotic dog. So redundantly under control with the leash. Uh, but Vaughan is one third people of color. That's not represented in this rendering. Uh, Vaughan is also, he's one of the figures under scrutiny as a slave owner. Rendering has a sick way of uh, selection, imagining a future, but then also deciding at the same time who belongs in that future. And you're selecting figures uh, and, and uh, this kind of cool, um, cold aesthetic uh, compared to uh, these ways of thinking about um, um, maybe uh, ecologically, how do you represent an ecology, how do you re represent social space, and who's even included in these, in these spaces. Um, I think I'll, let me just end with this quote by Sanford Quinter. Uh, when we use a genealogical urbanism that both invents and unearths embedded histories in the making, and through such invention transfigures and transvalues the very landscape on which it operates. So this idea that imagining new worlds is a way that rendering needs to be connected to the mythological, technological, political, and everyday aspects of life. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Marcy. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so, um, I thank you, Martine. I really appreciated your talk, and also David. I, it struck me as I was, you know, kind of thinking about the vast arrays of projects that were uh, presented. How um, both of you are, in a way. Uh, questioning very much the the how do I put this the viewer as the participant. So um, I think this was brought up by David early on when he talked about the you know the subjective view. How there is this moment where the kind of whether it's the viewer and their optics completing the rendering or their physical movement completing that rendering as part of the 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 art as subject. Whereas I think, Marcin, the kind of uh, the variety of projects that you showed really alerts, I think, uh, the public about not accepting images as 
uh, a given, but really being careful. I mean, every image that's made, given all the kind of the technological advances at our disposal, is a statement of some sort. There's kind of embedded values and political uh, ideology, um, or even the choices of, you know, hand versus vector versus raster. These are all evoking a particular idea about a romanticism or technological value in the drawing. So the subjectivity of all of this work is, I think, what makes rendering such an interesting topic right now because it, it relies a, a, a particular, um, I don't know, a deeper dive or a deeper investigation is, as to what is activating that rendering, whether in physical space or as a 2D image, right? Because we're looking at both ways of talking about the word um, of rendering. So I'd, it's not so much a question, but I just wanted to, that was my kind of summary um, of thinking about the two uh, projects or the two talks presented. And I think um, maybe one way that I will start the conversation uh, as, as a form of a question, uh, given that this is called homework, <laughs> uh, is, is that there, I think are, you know, I'm looking at some of the comments and feedback that there are a lot of questions about like, how do you choose what you use, what tools you use? So David, you showed a project that was photolistic um, light, tr light ray tracing rendering as a way to demonstrate the, sh the kind of reflection and reflect reflectivity of material in that last project. Um, like, how do you begin to choose among all of the different um, tools at our disposal something that further conveys the project at hand? I th it's really important to me as someone who's written a lot of code in my life and written a lot of code that other people use at various times to understand the the ways that tools guide the hand of the user or guide the eye or the mind of the user and to take that very seriously and so when choosing tools you have to take the same approach you have to think what what does this in a sense it's it's giving it too much agency but what do the creators of the tool imagine i should be doing with this and how is their imagining of possibilities going to expand and narrow the range of things that I'm going to be possible, be able to do or be guided to do, right? We're always making decisions when, when, when we're using a piece of software or any tool. Oh, it'd be a lot easier if I just cut this corner and did this thing because this tool won't do that. And that's one of the, the dangerous temptations when you can write your own tools is you always then imagine you can write the, create the perfect tool for the task that you're producing. And you, it creates this very complicated feedback loop where you are creating tools for creating a thing but in the process of creating a thing, it's informing the tool. And you can, if, you, if in the best of, of cases, you end up narrowing in on something really good. In the worst cases, you spiral off into uh, some sort of um, infinite regress of self-referentiality and it stops being interesting as a work it's, itself. But, but, but uh, and I think it's, I mean, I've lived over the course and worked over the, since the early eighties over a time when those tool sets available have gone through radical transformation. And in the 80s, the tools for rendering, for doing any of the kind of work that I have done interactively were so limited that that tool choice was not really an option. You had to make your tools and you had to live with what the tools were capable of. And so it's really interesting to watch as I teach students how their, how their, the, the, the challenge they're posed is so different than the challenge that was posed to me. It's really having too many tools and not having enough constraints or not knowing how to be, how to embrace a constraint and, and how to use that. So you know, the fact that we can do a photorealistic rendering creates a whole bunch of problems. The desire that, oh, it can be that much better if I just get more trees in there. And you know, you, you get, you, you get, you start putting time into the wrong places if you're not careful. So not just making tool choice, but making a decision about what the, most important element of your of this process of rendering is going to be is it as it was for me in that last project getting as realistic as possible or is that absolutely irrelevant and is it actually destructive to conveying the ideas of the project or whatever so mm.
Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that is um, this idea that I really mentioned about the viewer as participant. I think that that's an interesting question, uh, both as a participant in the design process and as a participant in the imagined space as a kind of resonance. Uh, in the design process, then it's the screenshot aesthetic and all these ways that the viewer is brought in or the participant is brought into. But and viewer is wrong because it's actually an imagined physical inhabitation. So participant right. it might be better. And the yeah. way the way Donald Judd talks, of, you know, he he normally sounds like a nice guy, but the one arrogant thing he says was, "Is uh, I'm the first person to put sculpture on the ground," and the reason being is that the space and the and the participants are part of the work, and so is the light, and the pro the project changes at at every moment. But then he has a specific way of eliciting a different kind of attention from people by the way he understands this process that you're invited to follow as well. So on both those fronts, um, the participant is part of it so that sometimes my dance background seems irrelevant to this conversation but it is a physical resonance that uh the, both the process of drawing and the process of imagining a space it needs to resonate like a musical subgenre where you're invited into it by a kind of you know rhythm and play and different kind of uh a certain invitation has to affect you and and uh, it, it's so it's different when you're producing a rendering uh to sell a project for a particular audience, but it's different if you're trying to imagine what kind of subgenre are you creating uh, and maybe as David's saying also inventing to to accomplish these uh, these uh, really complicated peripheral uh, kind of marginal effects uh, of the rendering where every choice has a decision and has a construction of a body, has a way of creating a way of thinking about a human. Mm -hmm. There's, I was um, triggered by your, not triggered negatively, triggered positively by your just the word McLuhan in your presentation think about McLuhan's notion of relation between visual perspective uh, and uh, an acoustic experience, acoustic space and visual space, and how he felt he was really, uh, really against properly rendered perspective because he felt it was a highly distancing, disembodying thing. Yeah. And he talked about acoustic space as being full of intervals and resonance uh, that engaged you and involved you in, in the space. And I just thought that was an interesting thing to throw in in relationship to that. Um, and the whole question of rendering. I mean, I, I think um, another kind of related question, I think, is from an audience member, Neil. When does the render exceed the real and why? <laughs> wow, interesting question. Uh, you know, the real is such an excess, uh, like with the Jane Hutton and the KLMO projects, because it's not at the scale of the human. So we could talk more about that, but the, both the particles of the material and the worldwide network of material flows. And in fact, uh, from indigenous perspectives, seasonal and cosmological elements and mythological elements flow into your understanding of space. So that's excess. That is unbelievable. So the rendering, for, in my view, is always a flattening because it's, it tends to uh, view it at the human scale only and not, not think about the entire cosmos that's implicated in the making of work. I mean, it does with it's the light effects so that is the sun, but it, I, and I love the way David works with it, but um, uh, it's always a cut and a separation and, a, and an abstraction. Uh, so, but, but I think you can rightfully ask, what does this abstraction do? And what, what does it need to do? What do I want it to do? And what, what, is, what, uh, what does it need to function with to communicate what I, what I need? Um, that is, I guess, the world, the reality. There, there was a very interesting experience I had when I was doing a, a piece I didn't talk about um, that was a visual perception system that was trying to understand what it was looking at and talk about it in language. And one of the big struggles that we have when trying to do computerized visual perception is that there's way too much detail for most of the visual perception stuff. To try to get an overall sense of objects in the scene, all the detail is, in, is completely distracting and throws all your all your algorithms off. Now this, this has changed a little bit with recent um, things in deep learning, but I ended up becoming very invested in blurs and finding <laughs> really good blurs, blurs that were very effective in helping the system to get an overall sense of what was going on in the image without being distracted by that detail. And so I think in a sort of indirect answer to the question, it's really a decision you make when you're doing a rendering how much detail you go into. And it's a trap you can get into about, oh God, I can I can make this much more high resolution and that will be better. It, it's not always better, it's often worse. And sometimes the thing glanced at a distance so it's slightly, slightly uh, um, out of focus is the best way to do it. I wear glasses and a lot of the, it's appearing in the background. I wear glasses 
And I think my experience of being short-sighted and experiencing the world that was blurry when I didn't know it was a problem and then going back and forth between high resolution and low resolution is very fundamental to, to my way of working. And I've actually, I've actually done art pieces about high resolution and fovea and blurs and things like that to get at that. Because it's an important part also about how our brain works. Because we're inventing that resolution all the time as well, which is, again, a much too long a talk to go into right now. But so, so it is, uh, I think it's a really important to make that decision at what point there are times when detail is absolutely fundamental and there are points when it's a complete distraction and the the technological tendency towards higher resolution being better sharper etc is something we have to be very careful to to consider conceptually in terms of how you know how we use tools in in various contexts yeah in fact neil wrote back and um, maybe adds to this conversation which is something that i was going to bring up which is that the render it is often preferred as it presents the impossible, AKA the ideal. You know, I remember working at architecture offices where if the sun is not in the right spot, move the sun <laughs> is what I was. So it is, I mean, I think to, to Marcin's work, there is often, you know, whether you show something in symmetry, you showed a series of images of Versailles, you know, kind of what, where that perspective is taken, where the viewer is taken, what is in the foreground, what is in the background, how high the viewer is, all becomes an idealization that's embedded in the translation of that image to a particular uh, intent. Mm -hmm. so one of the important things for me about building very fast renders for my work was to be able to find the worst perspectives. <laughs> Which for really me is, is, if you're really seriously producing a public artwork where right. the viewers are coming to exhibit, view it as a public, not to show off as an image that can be shown in a pamphlet somewhere, then it's the worst perspective that's the most important, not the best. That's a great point because now we're talking about the rendering as instrumental to testing or prototyping, which is an, often another way renders are used yeah. uh, more as a procedural kind of. Um, experimentation and not as the final image or product. So that's, that's really yeah. interesting. You have, you have a classic situation when you have a rendering in the sense of a digital rendering, you have, it's almost like the classic thing of the universal and the particular collapsing, right? The rendering is, the, is, a, is a slice or a viewpoint into this abstract form, may, may, given a visibility that we feel ex is accessible to us um, visually. And that, that point and that use of, of of rendering as a, as, a, as a way of exploring subjectivity in relationship to the thing that you're rendering is, a, is something that's not thought about very often, but it's, it's very significant in the projects that I showed where it is exactly that process of understanding really what the subjective experience is gonna be of this thing that is inherently abstract and doesn't right. exist yet. Yeah, so, the only thing, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, can I? Oh, let me, yeah, that's interesting points. Uh, I'll just say, uh, you know, the, the nomadic drift between all the different forms of the representation is what gets, gets, a, gets a designer or an artist from, from being locked into a, a single mode that can overdetermine uh, what, what can be possible, right? So, but, but each are inhabited in their own way, right? And rendering is inhabited as a plan is in a, in a different way, physical model. But if you're fluidly moving between those, then um, I guess you you avoid the um, this kind of mono way of looking at the project and you try to look it kind of grows in uh, in uh, richness in some sense. So maybe related to that is another audience question, which is: Do you think it is important for artists to learn the necessary skills to create their own renders, or are there ways we can collaborate with others to realize these types of renders? Yeah, good question. I would say, what is the work yeah, about? I think that there's a two part in there. There's the first is like, is it important that, you know, to have the skill of rendering because physical models were just brought up or other means uh, of, of figuring, you know, I think this person is specifically asking about kind of like uh, create digital renders or the second part of the question, like when you collaborate with others, uh, you know, is that do you maybe the voice is diluted or um, how do you kind of use that um, as part of the tool? And feel free if I'm botching your question to correct me. I think yeah. that, uh, 
that is an interesting question. Um, uh, I there are, se there are several ways to answer it. The first is to say um, it would, might be economically non-feasible for me to work with someone doing my renderings for me. I do all my renderings myself only because I spent so much time working with and pushing things around and re redoing my model that it would be prohibitively expensive to work with someone that way unless I trusted that they understood the vision of the project. The problem is often when I'm working in the rendering, I don't even understand the project yet. The project is, is, is emerging within the rendering, within my experience of the space, trying to, to be as, to have as much of a bodily experience of that space as I can given the flatness of the, of the medium. Um, the other thing that I think, this is a little bit off to the side, but there are artists who have produced their own rendering modes. So there's a Hungarian artist named Tomasz Waliski who spent a fair amount of time in the 90s working with programmers to code alternative ways of representing space in software. So he did one that was from a child's point of view. So everything was hyper egocentric and egocentric mode of representation. But another one that was quite uh, extreme was to render in reverse perspective mm -hmm. so that things get smaller as they get closer. And it's complete mind bending experience because you cannot make sense of what you're seeing. But what it argues for more broadly to me is that there's something encouraged by virtual reality and, and accurate 3D rendering, which is a kind of middle of the road reality. And what, what artists have traditionally had is the ability to bend the rules of perspective and to bend the rules of representation in order to get their idea across. And if we feed too closely to a kind of uh, to, to the given rendering systems, which tend towards ever, ever more reality, because that's you know, the, the, the mass tendency is going to be in that direction, we lose some of the expressive power of alternative rendering systems or atypical ways of rendering or atypical ways of processing, of dealing with that process. Yeah, and one note about the hyper real is, um, you know, it's not, uh, it, in a way it's also could be thought of as a mockery of nature, as a mockery of, uh, of light and material because it's, it's in no way is it that, and it still has a genre, it still has a kind of uh, temperature and kind of um, uh, idealization. And if you analyze it, the sun is often just like a, a, a halo that's illuminating, not not a, not so precise. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, 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 Rosalind Krauss's quote that uh, Matthew Allen also uses uh, in his ar uh, article in Scapegoat um, it, that talks about abstraction as the tension between materialism and realism, and in a way that, uh, that that's kind of tied to the history of uh, Disegno and uh, Colore that, that uh, I talked about in the Renaissance. Um, I find that's a kind of interesting way of thinking about rendering, uh, especially connected to this idea about the um, um, uh, how to enact your work. Like, does, does an artist need to learn rendering? Well, you need to collide ideas with material. And there's many ways of doing that. Sound recordings, uh, notes, uh, choreography, other kinds of writing somehow uh, an idea is enacted and worked upon and uh, in a material form. So sometimes that's a rendering, sometimes it's, a, it's something that you invent, uh, but it's a form of representation that helps you, uh, not just representation, enactment, I would say, because it, and it really depends on your practice and what you're getting across to find the right form uh, to do that in, uh, both as Vivian says, uh, both as a process thing, as well as a finished thing. But uh, yeah, we're privileging the process here to, uh, to a large extent though. So we have a very uh, last question here to close us out. And this question is from Tom Sokolowski. I'm going to read it. In the work I have undertaken, there is the unexpected which steps forward. In one case, the footprint of my work disrupted the June bugs every single day. And as a result, the goals swept in effect as a result, the goal swept in effect caused the public to confront a natural transformation of space. The question is, how does one render this in a way that deals with alternative participation, in this case, nature, or if one can say this, accounting for the phenomenology of a natural space? And in parentheses, he says the encampment for, in Fort York 2012 for Illuminato. I assume that's the project. That's nice. Uh, I'm, David, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, that's nice. It kind of uh, implies the uh, rendering as a, as a framework for a certain kind of improvisation. Um, like an interesting architecture or art project wouldn't happen um, in your mind. It would happen as a side effect or something of something that you're trying to do. And then you notice that something else is developing and then you embrace that. So I guess it, it, I would say it, it shifts the focus from 
think about um, objects and things that you that you and goals actually, and more into relations and connections and things that your project is functioning with, and leaving your rendering or your forms of uh, uh, enactment and representation open to these other things that creep in and might actually become the work. So it's an interesting reframing as a framework for improvisation um, rather than like a set choreography, if you will. Yeah, I, I agree. Hi, Tom, by the way. Um, uh, it's, it's always struck me that one of the great possibilities of rendering, but also the technologies I use in general, is the ability to, 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 to imagine open relationships um, of possibilities, structures of possibilities, and how, and, and the challenge is, there is a big challenge in rendering that, and in, 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 see, when you render a building, you give yourself some confirmation that it's going to kind of look like you expect, and you say, oh yeah, that's going to be what I want. When you render these more abstract notions of possible, of structures of possibilities, things that, you're creating the possibility that things might unfold, or you're, or you're removing blockages to things that might be inter interesting. You're trying to imagine how to expand the, the, the range of ways that it can be engaged with. And it's a kind of uh, engineering of the possible, which is a really interesting thing that, and it's hard to, I mean, to a certain degree, rendering can help you with that, but, it, but if it's just visual rendering, it seems like it's, it's, it's too limited, right? That, and it can give you a way to explore possibilities, but, but there, there, are, there, are, there are worlds of rendering like physics simulation, for example, um, instead of rendering a static image, you're rendering something that behaves according to the laws of physics, where you start to, you start to deal with the situations of the possible rather than a static structure. And that gets there to begin, to, to begin with, but it's really an exercise of the mind, I think, a sort of rendering exercise of the mind to imagine how to create openness in the work. Right. This, uh, like I sometimes I think, especially working interactively, I'm trying to design voids, empty spaces <laughs> where th that things can exist within, and places places that nurture possibilities. And filling that filling that thing is the wrong thing at that point. You have to engineer the space for that, and that's a very hard thing to render. Um, yeah, I, this is uh, tangentially related, but um, oh, here's Rebecca. I will just close out and said to Tom that I, I think you should look up um, this project uh, by Aranda Lash, which is, um, if you don't know it already, which has uh, pigeons documenting uh, Brooklyn um, and, and kind of the landscape of Brooklyn. So it's almost you're asking for a kind of reverse subjectivity to understand space. It's not just a depiction of uh, space as we understand it, which I think is an amazing project. So with that, um, I want to thank you all for being here and Rebecca's here to close us out. I would also like to thank everybody for joining us today. We had um, we had well over 100 participants, which is uh, amazing. The conversation was also really stimulating and uh, certainly, you know, I've been working in the field of public art for, for 20 years and I've not, there, there were you know, um, windows opened in my brain. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you to Vivian, David, and Marcin very much. Um, I think thinking about visualization as a, a rendering essentially as the visualization of something that doesn't exist and, uh, and the power that it therefore holds when it's expressing your idea. Um, when we talk about, um, you know, when Vivian was talking about the translation um, from verb to noun, when her sort of history of the word render, it made me think also about um, how the rendering is really capturing a specific moment in the progress of an artwork. And it's a really important moment uh, in the transition of an artwork from sort of a studio based practice to uh, part of a public art commission. Um, I love what uh, Marcin said near the end about uh, the suggestion that rendering is actually a framework for improvisation. Because what yeah, Jan and I have always talked about um, in talking about this summit and the online series is um, when art becomes public and how that happens. It's not necessarily a spatial definition, but something about how the work is received. So this is a really nice bridge to our next um, uh, webinar, which is on Wednesday, same time, same place. Well, no, not the same Zoom link. You'll be sent a Zoom link for this one, but theoretically the same place, your home. Uh, Wednesday, 3 p.m., we're talking about proposals with Chloe Catan from Waterfront Toronto and David Turnbull from uh, Edmonton.
Arts Council, and that conversation is moderated by Crystal Mowry from uh, Kitchener Waterloo Art Gallery. And then on Friday at 3 p.m., we have a discussion around materiality and fabrication, which is a conversation between uh, artist Mathieu McLeod and conservator Catherine Machado, uh, moderated by Jason Mushan. Um, so this whole uh, part, this is all part of online. It's an amazing uh, project that is really spearheaded by uh, Yan Wu at City of Markham Public Art and, uh, and Anik Glode at the Varley Art Gallery. And it's been a pleasure working with them. And I hope that you can join us uh, Wednesday and Friday. Thanks again to our panelists and to our audience. Take care.